the word of the day um, each time to kind of try together, tie together the speakers in our series. And just to kind of uh, let Greg and Ron know where you are fitting in, in in the course of the semester. We started out by examining uh, the word plan uh, when we were talking with uh, Darren Jensen about maps. Um, then we thought about the word image when Lauren Kreuz was uh, talking to us about uh, the image of the city as represented in the mural. And last week, we looked at the word legibility, both in terms of Kevin Lynch's um, approach to urban form, and we also uh, were looking at basically how this and Virginia interpreted legibility in the city. Mm. So the word of the day is sense. And uh, I'm sure Greg will disagree with me on, on what I'm about to say, because uh, and I'll give him a chance to respond to uh, the word capturing, which we uh, titled his talk today, and a word which he strenuously objects, so I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about that. So we use the word sense in two opposite ways. One is uh, the way that we interpret or take in the city or anything else through our five senses, through our bodies. We also use the word sense specifically to mean that which we attribute to information that we do not use our senses for. So when you have a sense of danger, a sense of foreboding, you have a sixth sense, those are to mean exactly the opposite of those things. Um, we are sensing also, obviously, to the kind of sensing that uh, Greg and Ron uh, are going to talk about today. And in some, in some ways, that can be a substitute okay, for our, our bodily senses. But the first and third meanings, sensing our senses and having an intuition, both of those add up to uh, the meaning of sense, which is to grasp meaning. So as we were talking about with Georgina uh, and Chris last week, obviously we sense through our bodies. Um, and we sense through machines. This is what comes, this is the top uh, item that comes up if you Google sense because they're the new Kickstarter campaign for this new sensor telling you how to sleep. Um, but those two kinds of sensing add up to what Jane Austen was talking about when she was talking about sense and sensibility. She used sense to mean rationality and logic and the kind of understanding that we offer in social sciences or in planning uh, aim for. Um, and she contrasted it with sensibility, which in this case meant uh, kind of emotions and feelings, which are also absolutely necessary uh, to our understanding of, of cities. Uh, and as Antonio Damasio, a neurologist, has pointed out, you cannot have a rational understanding without the input of your body and the emotions that are held in it. Um, I just wanted to end with the word um, soft eyes. Um, and this came to me as I was uh, watching the fourth uh, season of The Wire. Does anybody know the, uh, the episode called Soft Eyes? Um, okay, so basically when Georgina last week was talking about her sense of the city and how it contrasted with that of sighted people, she said sighted people are so frontally oriented, right? Both because you know, our eyes are on the fronts of our heads, as most predator species have them. Um, and she talked about being aware of a sphere all around her. That made me think of having eyes in the back of your head, which you need to have if you're a little school teacher, which is what the reference was um, in the wire. When the, the young policeman ends up a school teacher in the inner city school and is completely lost because his eyes are far, he's looking for something specific, he doesn't have that feeling in the city to be um, Same way, Buck, the homicide detective, tells the new uh, Kima, the younger detective, if you're investigating, you need to have soft eyes. You need to see the forest for the trees. You need to be aware of all around you without always looking for the one thing you're looking for, which is the danger. Whenever we're examining cities, whether um, we're counting pedestrians or uh, measuring income or whatever it is that we're doing, if you're looking for that one thing, you're going to find it, maybe. But you may be missing a lot of other things. So the, the concept of soft eyes, which apparently also comes from Aikido, um, I think it's useful for us to think about as we're examining different ways to approach the city. And so a question I have is when you are um, collecting, is collecting an okay word, data, and sharing data, um, can that help us be, look at the city through soft eyes, 
was going to be the opposite. So, That's an excellent question. Yeah, so now I'm going to uh, let uh, Greg and Ron uh, step in. Uh, Greg is the director of representative media. He's on the art practice faculty, um, has done all kinds of interesting work uh, around uh, art, technology, and people in their environments. He's been a great friend of the Global Human Humanities Initiative. Um, your talk and Ron Royale is from our architecture department um, and is known for many things, but uh, most intriguingly to me is work on materials, um, whether it's writing books about uh, buildings made of earth or uh, making the things out of the salt of San Francisco Bay with a 3D printer. This is the kind of stuff that Ron does. So <laughs> eager to hear them uh, talk about their course, which is the Global Urban Humanities methods course for this fall. Thank you. Well, um, maybe just a little bit, yes. So, it is it is true what you said at the very end, that the soft eyes versus hard eyes question is absolutely central to what we're trying to do. And our very last slide will go really into that uh, topic, and so we're very, looking, very much looking forward to the last slide. But before we get there, uh, we're going to just start telling you a little bit about uh, how our course was generated, and how it's working, and what we'd like to achieve with it. So. Um, indeed, the word capturing, what the, the title of this lecture is, is bothering me a little bit because capturing means that you want to take something and control it, right? You, you don't have it, you capture it. That means you now hold it by its neck and say, ha, I got you, right? And, and that's exactly the kind of attitude many people have about data, that they want evidence that something that they were always thinking was going on now can be proven. So proof, right? And, and oftentimes they want to prove that somebody did something wrong. Like for example, a license plate reader um, uh, that a police car might have on its uh, deck uh, would uh, tell the policeman that this car is stolen. We have captured the evidence that something is wrong here. But actually, we, we don't want to use data that way. We want to use data simply as a necessary asset for what we call a reality-based community. Uh, a reality-based community is a group of people who have to contend with reality, and it's never quite what it seems, and we can't even quite sense it all the time. Uh, we need media to sense it better, and to understand it better, and then to figure out where we, where we want our actions to fit into that reality, and which actions are the right actions to take, and which actions are the wrong actions to take. So the way we see data is as a, as a tool for everybody to make uh, decisions uh, more effectively and then to take action accordingly. But before we go too deep in all, all, into all these topics, I wanted to thank Jen Walsh and uh, Susan Moffat for making this situation here a reality. Everything you see on the table, all the people you see in the room, and all the people you see talking to you only came together because of these two women's work. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, with that, I think we can get started. So yeah. let's get our first slide on. And is historically, uh, planners, architects, urbanists understood cities in a couple of ways. They were made of objects and they were made of spaces, and they're understood in plan through Noli maps. And the contemporary city is much more complex than that. Sure, it's made out of objects and it's made out of spaces, but it's also able to be understood in multi dimensions, in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, and beyond. So we are looking at fundamentally a couple of things sensing uh, data, but also object and object making and learning through object making. So we're asking the question, how does object, how do objects create space? And we could go through a list of, you know, a hundred ways that objects make space. We could think about the function of the object. What does an object do and what is the space that the object creates? So for example, the CCTV camera on a wall and kind of the response to that and the kind of space that that makes. The location of an object, what does it mean to push an object into a particular space? And, and what kind of spaces emerge from that, like on parking day, where now parking spaces become parks. And the sign and symbolic meaning of objects, not only in the fact that that particular object is a sign that says chair, but attached to the telestrut that holds up the sign, it can be rotated and become a chair. And so there are all these possibilities to think about objects, not only at the scale of, of the hand, 
but of the car, of the building, of the city, and of the region. And we can think about those objects in relationship to the kinds of spaces that they make. Okay, so now the next slide is about how does data make places? And um, I'm looking at a clock there from the late uh, 18, 1890, something like that. It's in San Francisco, it's on Market Street. It was a clock that marked a public service. Um, at the time, people didn't have wristwatches, and in order to get together, they needed to have public clocks all over the place at the time to say, okay, let's meet at noon at, the, at Market Street. And then there was a clock there, they would often meet by the clock because that's how they could tell they were at the right place at the right time. And so, so that kind of data, temporal data, shapes the city. And this goes way, way back. This goes back to, uh, to minarets and uh, church towers and bells ringing and prayer calls. And, and the purpose of bells and prayer calls was really uh, both secular and spiritual, secular in the sense that uh, people needed to know when the day began, when the day ended, and when it was the middle of the day so, so they could organize their, their civic flow of um, the, the civic metabolism according to that data. So, so the churches and uh, minarets were sound markers for, uh, for organizing a community. Um, now, a different kind of data that we're very familiar with is, of course, the map. And here we have a picture of the uh, map of downtown San Leandro, presented in downtown San Leandro with this famous marker, you are here, which is such a beautiful thing because it's an abstraction of your very present moment of the here and now. It's an abstraction of that on a piece of paper or on a, on a, on a map. And so it situates you both in the real place where you already are and in the ideal place of the map and the Cartesian grid that the city planners have imposed on the grid, and it's, it's reinforced by, by mapping itself onto the location um, that it's in. Uh, and so that's another way to, in which city, uh, data organizes the city. How would, you, how would you have a straight line if you didn't have a map to plan it with first? Uh, another uh, aspect is, is uh, this kind of display that I saw in Helsinki. Uh, it's a company of JC Deco, they normally serve up ads. And uh, in this case, they were only allowed to serve ads in the city of Helsinki if they also offered a public service. And the public service they agreed on was to put uh, 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 weather maps into the uh, trams and into the public. Uh, this is actually a moving trams. So it's very cool and you get the, the update about what's the weather like and you can figure out maybe where you want to get off or if you want to take a longer trip based on where the sun is shining the most. It's very important in Helsinki because they, they have a very short summer. And uh, so, so that's another way in which data organizes the city by telling people where to go depending on, on, on information that's available uh, about the weather. And uh, so all that uh, shapes the place. And what do we do with that? We want to learn to combine these two languages. We want to combine the language of the object and the language of data and see how we can use those two languages to improve uh, civic processes. So our blueprint here is to talk about City 1.0, version 1.0, and City 2.0, and to figure out how we can go through a process of renewal. Today is a, a, a Jewish New Year, right? So Shana Tova, Happy New Year, it means it's a time of renewal as well. So when I see that word, I have to think about renewal. In fact, some people aren't here because they're busy renewing themselves, right? Um, but anyways, it's a really beautiful concept, and. Uh, uh, we ask what languages might be useful to figure out what kind of renewal is possible for a city. And uh, there's, of course, the civic language of, of uh, community meetings and council meetings and so forth, but there's also a technical language. And in our course, we want to uh, address all these languages. And so, so let's see what we have here. We have GIS. I'm not really an expert on GIS, but I know somebody who is. Um, uh, can you tell us what GIS stands for? Uh, Geographic Information Systems. Yes. Sciences, but... Yes, and it's, it's, a, it's a way of, of getting data onto maps uh, through digital means and uh, there's uh, various tools that we talk about. We use Google uh, Maps Pro uh, to get uh, beautiful KML data sets and to describe, for example, the boundary of the city and inscribe that on, on the map or to inscribe <coughs> hubs of activity on a map or, or place, mark places where photos were taken or uh, add other kinds of geographic data. So that's one language we're looking at. Uh, the next one, STL, uh, you're an expert on that one, so go for it. So STL uh, is, short, is short for stereolithography, and it's one of the oldest types of 3D printing. It was invented in the 80s at, um, at MIT, and it's a file type 
that has transcended all of the years to become the uh, fundamental file type for 3D printing from transferring digital models and 3D models to speak to 3D printers. And we have a 3D printer over here, which we're using in the class where you have four of them that students are gonna start to engage just today, in fact, uh, to learn how to 3D model and to use STL formats in order to speak to 3D printers to produce physical objects. And tell, tell them what to do, right? The 3D printer to do, right? Yeah, okay. And then we have uh, C++, another language. That's a language that helps us uh, control microchips. In this case, we use something called Arduino. And this demonstration device here has been counting how many of you are in the room. And every time somebody moves, it lights up red and it counts somebody else has passed by. And so inside of here, there's a little chip, and that chip we program using Arduino language, which is based on C++. And that language talks about how to make words into machines. It's a beautiful concept. You have a word, and the word means uh, ping, out, equals, and then we say output or input. And we determine if a piece of electricity um, is going to flow into the machine or out of the machine. So it's literally writing machines with words. That's what C++ does for us. And uh, looks like we went to sleep here. Um, we have the next language, which is D3. That's a data-driven document language. That's data-driven documents, 3Ds. Uh, and that's the language we use to take data that we measure with the C++ language about a, and an object that houses it in a place that is described like this. So it's a sequence, a chain of pearls, as you will. And now we have data that comes out about CD 1.0, and we can describe that with the data-driven documents. If, um, it's a, uh, a web uh, standard for sharing uh, data online. And with the D3, we can make information public and share it with uh, people who have access to, to new media, and uh, maybe even in public sites with screens outside and so forth, just like the JC Deco screen. And then we go to the last language, which is the language of civic deliberation, in which people look at data and say, what does this thing mean? And, and it, it's not an object anymore, it's a thing that means we, it, its meaning is contested in the public, right? There's a very important essay by Bruno Latour called Making Things Public, and there was a big exhibit. And, and he spoke uh, uh, so compellingly about uh, the thing being something that we have to gra gradually have to come together about and say, we are now all agreeing that this thing means that. It's not an object. An object is pretty clear what it is because it speaks for itself. But a thing is something we have to come together about and agree about what its meaning is. And so, so this data then in D3 and in the civic process becomes something we learn to agree about and deliberate about. And thus, at the end, we have a result and we can apply the result and decide how we're going to renew the signal. And so that's our vision, and we're doing all this in the city of San Leandro, which is a wonderful partner city. Now, this is an uh, abstract representation of San Leandro. And uh, if we look at all these languages, we invest them now in this process, right? We measure something in city one, put it in a database, put it online with in D3, and then we go through a civic process of figuring out what the data means. And then we um, gain insight from it, and if the insight tells us that something's wrong, we have to take some kind of action. We have to come together and say, okay, as citizens of San Leandro or as city council, we now prioritize this action and to change things. We go back through the cycle, measure again, and see if the change that we made actually had the impact we desired. If it didn't, we have to take another action, and it's still sad. But if it did, we're very happy, and we say, hey, this worked for us. We're relieved, we renewed our city. And then we can uh, pass the I insight on to other cities, and they can try as well. And so then the idea spreads that way. So now, now let's put this into practice. Let's talk about what we actually did in the class concretely and how we started. So, so Ron, you went deep down. Yeah, so uh, several students and I explored uh, San Leandro Creek. One of them is here, I thought. Uh, maybe not. Uh, okay. uh, so, so we explored Ooh. San Leandro Creek, and San Leandro Creek is, is really an amazing watershed that is a dry basin that runs through San Leandro, but it's completely inaccessible to the city. But as you see in the photograph, it's extremely beautiful and really looks quite developed. And so the students and I took a hike through San Leandro Creek for about two hours or so, uh, walking through the creek, really walking through the city with just moments where we understood the city encroaching upon the creek or the creek encroaching upon the city but really 
no direct connection. So this becomes a site for us of tons of potential because it is a site where it is extremely popular with those who want to go into the creek. It's a site that is, the temperature is much cooler. There's wildlife in the site and people are even starting to make um, residences in that creek uh, informally. And so we, we moved into the creek and then the students map, this is yours, Will, yeah. So the students mapped the creek using Maps uh, Engine Pro, Google Map Engine Pro, and began to document. So they're able to track their trail and their access into the creek, uh, show particular sites that are, that are important or interesting with the creek to kind of unveil that hidden potential of this place and, and kind of map it out. And this becomes accessible and this becomes public and this becomes shareable. And so from there, we began to explore ideas about how to take, okay, we're really going through this process that Greg just outlined, to look at the sites of potential, to map and understand the sites, and then to make interpretations, creative interpretations that are saying, all right, one of the potential might be, let's say, to think about a way to understand wildlife, for example. Um, and so the students then will begin to learn how to 3D model in order to make a dialogue between them and the 3D printer to tell the 3D printer what to do so they can produce their objects, which then they can go back into the site with to uh, measure. And so, for example, this is uh, examples of 3D uh, modeling that moves into the 3D printer, 3D printers over there. And then there becomes this beautiful synthesis between the object and the machine and the words and the data and uh, to create objects that might do something. What this does, we don't know yet, but it might be installed into that site in order to see if birds really go to bird houses and what kind of birds and, and how heavy are they, what size are they, do we need to make bigger bird houses, if there are a lot of birds, what does that mean for this site, how can we measure things, and so this is an example. Also a way of designing and thinking about the integration between uh, hardware, object, software, and I guess we can pass this around. And it's really about object iteration of going from making one thing, prototyping it, uh, making it better another time, making it better again, and then moving it into uh, deployment. So here's some other examples of that. And you can pass this around. Other ideas, other iterations about thinking about this might, this is full of soil, you can pass that around. But ways to think about how we might, uh, maybe this is an opposite condition where we're actually bringing vegetation into a site that has no vegetation, what does it mean are we able to sense if people linger in a space longer in public space because there are plants and we can measure that and collect that. Oh, it's my, okay, good. So I have to say, if you go a few slides back, Ron, and you show your, this is the first slide we showed in the course, the, the one with the objects. And Which one? The one with the chair. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. And and I didn't, I never seen this before, so I was like, wait a minute, Ron, I'm really inspired by this. You, you, what is this stuff called, this material? It turns out it's called Unistra or Telestra. It's all over the United States. It's two by two inches. It's got these holes in it. And I thought, what a wonderful place to insert into the city. And, and so the uh, first thing I wanted to do was to say, oh, I've got to, I'm going to copy this chair idea, right, shamelessly. And then I said, well, I don't really need a chair there. What I really need is a place to put my backpack when I wait for the bus. Uh, and so, so I was like, all right. Uh, and then Ron said, hey, and after he used this thing called one, two, three design, and I was like tooling around with it. And this was my first result. It wasn't very successful. It didn't fit. And it was all wrong. And then Ron sent me out to the street with the caliper. It was very, very funny to walk around in Oakland with a, with a digital caliper, measuring exactly the space between the, the two things. And, I, and people wonder what I was doing. So that's the second version. This one's also way too big. And then the third version started fitting. And then the fourth version has these, these little clips on it so it actually snaps in. So now I can put it back. Oh, we tested it and then the backpack fell off. It's very embarrassing. And then, and then uh, we, we uh, made this version with the clips that you suggested. And then now it snaps in and it really stays and it works great. So this is the actual thing you see in the photograph. And one point about that is that we started a material dialogue. Oftentimes we have dialogues in, in university with words, right? That's what the term means. But uh, now we have this kind of material dialogue where you send me a file and, have, and then I print it and try something out, modify it, send it back to you. So it's a, a dialogue with things and it's so exciting to have that. 
that exchange. And so this is one of the things that the students will have the opportunity to do. So in going back and forth and having a, this isn't the Arduino board, but a, an Arduino board, and we had to think, well, how do we make an interface between the Ardu Arduino board and a 3D printed object? And this became that interface, that middle uh, scenario that now I shared with Greg, Greg had comments on it, I changed a little bit, I'll be sharing with the students today, the students might modify it, so the students could either blend it into the 3D print, might attach it in some way, and it makes this interface, they might invent new versions of it, and everything gets better because the particular software we're using allows us to make these kinds of sharing and exchanges uh, digitally much, much faster. Yes, yes. And so, so then we also have a, an object that proves the concept, and sometimes I'm like, all right, does this work? Is this strong enough? And it turns out that if I do this in public, you know, this is not good enough, right? It just breaks. And it's not strong, so uh, then I iterate and figure out a way to make it stronger by having two surfaces inside the cylinder, not one, right? And so there's a hole here now, and the hole turns out makes things stronger. You see the difference? And you pass that around as well. So it's really fun to just uh, touch these things and break them and then make them better. Uh, Anyway, so I was uh, showing this to another grad student in the art practice department, and Isaac's here from the art practice department. So, so uh, and, and the, uh, the student said, oh, that is so bougie of you to make a, a, a hanger for your backpack so it won't touch the floor at the bus station. That is so bougie. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know what, you're right. So that's another kind of dialogue. So I was thinking, um, that's really a silly concern. Let's find out a more or substantive concern to deal with. And so we had a number of meetings with the city, uh, city staff, and they started telling us that the real problem they have, uh, the, next slide. the real problem they have in San Leandro is that there's a lot of people walking up and down the railway track, which is an active railway track, because there's no good footpaths. So it is safer to walk along the railway track than along the roads because the, there, is the side, the, there is no real sidewalk, so they don't go the right way. And uh, so they have hundreds of people every day walking up and down the railway paths. And of course, they're concerned that somebody might get run over by, by a train. It's coming back. All right. So, so, so then they said, what we really need is we need to know how many people walk up and down these tracks. And then we need to figure out where they get on and off the tracks, and then we can figure out how we're going to improve, perhaps, um, our, our, and prioritize our, our pedestrian traffic projects to renew the city in exactly the right way. So, so for them, data, in this case, was a way to prioritize which is the correct action to take first. Remember we talked about, about reality and how to influence reality through actions? Well, that's what they're doing. And, and so, so what they needed, however, was a people counter. And it turns out people counters are expensive and hard to find. Usually people uh, count people by having somebody stand at the street corner and make little marks on a piece of paper counting how many people walk by on a given day. And that's not very effective. And it's also not a, that's a capture method. Somebody's sitting there saying, oh wait, I see a person crossing the street, mark. And, and that's not good enough because it's not a continuous stream of data. What I, what I imagine, and this comes back to the soft eyes concept is, what I imagine when I close my eyes and think about data is I think about feeling things all over the place and just feeling how they are. And I'd like to be able to feel all people walking across the city as if they were, you know, something I could touch with my hand. I could feel, oh, they're walking this way, they're walking that way. I'd like to feel that data. And so to make that happen, we have to establish data streams. A data stream doesn't mean we're conducting a study from day one to day seven and then telling people about the results of the study. But rather, we measure stuff from here on to eternity continuously. We don't stop measuring. And, and like that, we can constantly adjust our policies and we can constantly dynamically adjust the way the city is built and make the city a much more responsive environment. So then we said, okay, instead of making this bougie coat hanger, we're gonna make a, a counter that's called the high counter. It just says hi to people because that's friendly. And it says, it says hi every time somebody walks by. It doesn't really say that literally, but it says it symbolically because it acknowledges the human presence. And has a little light that blinks, just like the demo over there. And if, if Jennifer moves, usually it turns itself on again. There, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that did it. And so we counted another person alive there, great. And so that's the design, and that's where it came from. It literally came from one conversation and then from this uh, basic interface. So we're having a lot of fun with this. So now what we're gonna do is, uh, put these uh, sensors, they're cheap to make, they're, you know, they, they're under $50, I think. Um, and for that kind of project, that's pretty cheap, especially because we can put them in different places. 
at different times. And we can put them on, a, on an intersection like this, perhaps, and start counting how many people walk by. And using some fancy math that I don't know yet, uh, we're going to figure out from these kind of point sources of data what the dynamics are, where people walk from, how people walk from one place to another. So we can uh, translate these numbers into streams and model where people walk. And then we can start asking the question, well, if we want more people to walk down the, to the creek, for example, where do we build the bridge or the footpath that takes us down there? Or if we want to build sa safer pedestrian traffic in San Leandro, from where to where do we need to build a path that really makes sense? There's even a bridge that's closed down because of security concerns of some kind, and so maybe we have to open that bridge up. And so maybe we can generate the data uh, that will tell us, to help us decide what is the right thing to do. I'm checking my time here. Okay. Um, so we're thrilled about all this, and uh, there's one important component that, that we add to it. Um, this is a, a, one of our amazing GSIs, Pablo Paredes. He, uh, he just built this same thing, but with a uh, mobile phone attached to it. So now instead of this thing measuring and us checking the data every week or so, the, there's an there's a machine-to-machine -machine mobile phone in the device that sends the data to a website. And this is a pretty much a live view from you know, up till noon when we started the lecture, preparing for the lecture and taking this last screenshot, um, of the data coming in. Uh, uh, this is actually measuring light right now because that's another project we're doing, but same idea. The data would uh, flow straight from the device to a website uh, through uh, mobile technology, and uh, that is really exciting because that makes the data public when it's generated. So there's no discrepancy between when the city knows something and when the citizen knows something. It's very important to have these two concepts together. And uh, so that's the core of making things public, that everybody has access at the same time. Now, we're a little bit idealistic here. We do understand that, in fact, uh, not everybody can read a chart like this. There's an educational component. Not everybody has a phone on their uh, with them that can read this kind of website. Not everybody has the data bandwidth and the resources to pay for that kind of data. And not everybody knows that this data is evidence of their livelihood, of their lives going a certain way, and that they can use that as, as a way to make a case for improving their lives. It's a very important uh, question. How many people think this kind of thing is empowering? How many people uh, realize that this is their story? How many people can see themselves in this data? And how many people can realize that uh, they can change that data? And that's exactly the question we want to end on tonight, uh, or this, uh, today, is uh, the, uh, this, this question of how do people work with data? And there's two approaches that, that I'm aware of here. One of them is the hypothesis-free approach, the soft eyes, if you will. And then the other one is the hypothesis-driven approach. And that's the more classical one, and each one has its advantages and disadvantages. The hypothesis-free hypothesis approach is one that Ron and always engages in, where, where, you, where you so boldly say, I don't know what this is going to be, I'm just going to do the next step, right? And you, do, you didn't set up the end goal yet. You didn't go out to answer a specific question. You said, oh, I'm going to play with this Unistrot thing and see what else I can plug in and so forth. And then every version that you're doing is, in a way, a new idea that leads to another new idea. And it's never final. And that, isn't, that, isn't that a hypothesis-free approach? How do, you feel, how do you feel that out when you move on from one thing to the next? I mean, I think in that scenario, it opens up a world of possibilities. Eventually, you land on something, but you, have, you build up a library of possibilities that you can then engage and finalize eventually. In a way, this is like the question of a thesis. The thesis opens up a kind of provocation. The provocation leads you to certain places, and you can then narrow in and focus on that. So I don't know, in the series of experiments, if we're going to end up with a place that will plants or birds, what we're going to measure. But ultimately, it might lock into a very particular place, a very particular object, and a very particular kind of sensor in order to get there. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more free in this because uh, it's, I'm taking this on as kind of a research endeavor versus a particular <coughs> assignment. Uh, I think uh, the students have to, to focus in much more quickly and say, OK, I'm going to measure this. I have a particular uh, concept that I need to pursue and, and move towards completion. Well, it's because we're, we're in a university where there's such a thing as tenure, and we get to spend the rest of our lives trying to figure out stuff. Even if none of it means anything to anybody, it's fine, right? In city government, if you spend a year figuring something out and there's no result at the end, you're fired. We can spend five years studying something and we won't be fired, right? We might not get the next grant, but... You know, that's the whole idea. And in fact, 
as students, the same thing is true. We should be able to spend a time figuring stuff out that interests us and that's urgent to us without having our degree in mind. And that's something that's being challenged many times and in many ways. It's more and more, you don't have that time. You've got to finish in two years or four years or whatever it is, and you don't have. So it's important to, to admit that this approach here is a high risk approach. And not everybody can afford it all the time. So when I talk to city managers about all the data we can measure and how great it is and how people can discover facts about their communities and then like for example air pollution and say oh um, I learned that the air pollution is high when trucks are on 580 in my neighborhood and I really don't like that and I want you to change the policy then the city will say well uh, we can't change the policy 580 is not our business it's the business of Caltrans and we're not Caltrans so you know don't bother us anymore and so I explained basically my dream of how beautiful it is if people have evidence about their experiences in life and how they can uh, use those evi this evidence to change things. And, and they told us, you know, your dream is our nightmare. <laughs> That's exactly what we want to avoid. The last thing we want is for citizens to have more information and to give us more work. And I was like, oh, this meeting is not going so well. And, and then I said, all right, all right, all right, let's retool this a little bit. So this is one approach, the hypothesis for approach. What they liked a lot was this people counting, because they had a problem already, and that was their hypothesis-driven approach. They said, what if we could figure out where to put these footpaths and make the city more walkable? Could you give us data for that? And so, so that's the exact opposite. That is uh, low risk, we can count it, we know exactly, and we have already, in, in this setup here, there's already the willingness of the city to do something. They already identified uh, a, that they have a flexibility, that they can do something about it. And now they just want to optimize, they want to say, they want to prioritize, they want to figure out um, uh, which are the projects that are in need of more information and how does the information help us make better decisions about prioritizing projects that we wanted to do anyways. And so, so then we combine the data with the action potential of the community. The, the community has a certain ability to act and they want to act more effectively. So what kind of data will help them take the most effective action. So and that, of course, is very constrained because they already decided that they're going to do something. So, for, for example, in the San Leandro Creek project, the city is already working to think about that creek as a developed creek, pedestrian path. But they are unsure of exactly what to do. But I could imagine that that becomes a project where this idea of the pedestrian uh, path, making it a more pedestrian-friendly city, becomes much more let's say, close to their own visions and, and the visions of the students' uh, work in the, in the course. So there are people going down into this path already. They're walking around. How many at what times? We don't really know, but we can find out. We can find out what times people are down there. People are going down there and drinking beer and smoking pot and, and hanging out and hanging out in the shade, doing a number of things that we witnessed at the time. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's also this amazing place, and the city is looking at more pedestrian access in the, in the city. Here's a pedestrian corridor that already moves through the city, and so we want to find out what kind of data can we start to uh, acquire in order and analyze and understand in order to make a convincing argument for doing particular design proposals in that creek. The city. And so then we, we, we get to this place where we have less risk because the whole thing is more constrained already and the outcomes are more, more shape, shape, pre-shaped and we potentially have more impact because we actually can do something about it. On the other hand, we, we impose a lot of unnecessary limitations on things. We say, well, why are we measuring this and not that? While we're measuring this, why don't we measure everything else too? Well, here the problem is that we have a lot of unintended side effects and thus this, that's the, what produces fear in data. Because data changes its meaning every day. You think data means one thing today, well, tomorrow it'll mean something else. Your frequent flyers mile, miles today, they mean that you get to fly to Hawaii on your vacation. Ten years from now, your frequent flyer miles will mean that you polluted the earth and that you will have to pay a fine for all the things that you did in the past. So the data can flip on you and suddenly mean something totally different. That's an unintended side effect of collecting everything, not knowing what it means yet. Another unintended side effect is when we measure air quality, suddenly we might be able to uh, describe things that make it impossible for a developer to build a 200 hou unit housing project in, uh, in San Leander where they want it to because it turns out the air quality is not that great. And so suddenly the city loses its revenue because of things they measured 
right? And they're really concerned about this. this is a concrete example. And they, they said, you can measure anywhere except where we have housing projects, uh, housing development projects going on. And, uh, and I said, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why would we not measure where things are happening? And they said, well, because we were concerned that the data might make it impossible for us to take action. So, so we have that those are, left. Yes. We get yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. So, so those are the two points, right? Um, are we going to be uh, soft eyes, wide open, and open to all sorts of unintended side effects? Or are we going to be focused and determined and have a lot of impact and not much risk, but uh, maybe do something that's far less important than the other thing that was in our periphery there? So um, I think I think that's it. Do you want to wrap up somehow? Or? No, I think that was a good wrap up. Okay, good. So, so I just wanted to, to open up so, questions. And yes. I'll, can I put yes. the up? I think what's really interesting, and just to kind of put this in the context of the speakers we've had so far, you're the first folks who are uh, intervening, uh, really, in the landscape. So in, in the Global Urban Humanities Initiative, a lot of what we're thinking about is the connection between interpretation and intervention between observing and making. Um, and so earlier in the semester, folks were talking about, you know, observing and making maps, looking at murals kind of not without an intention to make something. And then we have you all intervening without, but what's interesting because we were talking about the image of a city earlier in the semester, and it seems like you all wanted to come in kind of without an image of the city, right, with, with no hypothesis. So the folks in San Leandro, they have their own knowledge and image and idea. They're sitting in with problems on what they need. And you're coming in kind of fresh saying, let's just look at everything. And then you're, you're coming into conflict that way. So what's interesting to me is um, the construction of the mean of a city, if it's not connected to that future intervention, what does that mean? Because you're trying to understand the city starting from a different place from the local residents and the local bureaucrats. So, right. You know, how do you, how do you approach that? Well, I think it's a, it's a really wonderful conflict. It's the it's the conflict between sort of idealism and practicality. It's it's the uh, it, and it's it's a conflict that's very productive if we pay attention to what's happening. And um, so, ideally, we both learn from each other in that situation, and we say, "Oh, that's what you needed. That's what you're concerned about." And while we were learning what you're concerned about we are bringing in the possibilities that Ron was speaking about earlier, that, that people who lived there for too long, they lost. Because the key thing is, the difference between now and the future is our imagination. The difference between what is happening right now and what's going to happen next is, is in our imagination. And without that, you can't go into a different future either. You have to imagine things to be different, right? And so that's what we're bringing to the table, is that extra imagination and what they're bringing to the table is the real need, the, the, the thing of it, right? And so when these things come together, then we can imagine things being different, and then that's the ideal point. So, questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, I sort of understand and see the possibility of beneficial stuff coming from this. But what about um, concerns for, like, surveillance and security and control? It's sort of something like this, like if the city gave it to the police department, to measure, you know, how many people are going to, to the, you know, that river well, stream. Yeah, that's the trouble. Like, you know, the policeman could look at this as well, this open data stream, and say, ah, um, we have a bunch of transients uh, um, at Sector 9. Let's go there right now and arrest them all, right? And so it's all a question of who sees the data and what do they do with it, right? And uh, that is a tremendous uh, topic. The fact is, of course, that... Um, surveillance is, is similar to uh, data streams in the sense that data is being collected, but the difference is that the data is not being shared with those who are described. That's very, very important, right? So ultimately, these kinds of devices are intended to describe the people to themselves versus a license plate reader or some other system like that or flying over the city with low-flying aircraft. Those are all tactics to to capture information, there comes that word again, that's, that you then have, but somebody else doesn't have. And so we know, we know more about you than you do. But this train has long departed, right? Um, there's been a study that showed that it, there's an 80% chance that um, a, a data corporation such as Google, Google can tell you where you will be 80 weeks from now. Exactly. 80 weeks is a long time, that's more than a year. 
And, and so, so your behavior, your pattern is so well understood by, by the data you produce and by the models associated with that data, there's a lot of prediction going on. And uh, so, so it's really a question of who has access to this data. And, and so there's an educational component as well where we say, well, this is what is knowable about you and let's participate in that and make that a dialogue. So it's part of the conversation. And this conversation, I think, comes from experiential learning. I, I don't think we would we would be able to ask these kinds of questions were we not intervening in the landscape. I don't think it, would be, it, would, it wouldn't necessarily come up. And the one thing that I learned about sensors this, uh, so far this semester that I never realized is that these sensors become desensitized. I didn't I imagine that, but the more you sense with these kind of sensors, the they more- They get exhausted. They get exhausted. And mm -hmm. so uh, the people in environments also get exhausted. So the crazy thing about this San Leandro Creek uh, is that people have turned their back on it for decades and decades. Uh, they first, they went, 30 years ago, the woman who took us on a tour said, yeah, when I was a kid, I used to come down here and make out and, and drink beer. And she says, now I don't let my kids down here because I don't want them to come down and make out and drink beer. So they become desensitized to something that's incredibly productive and turn their back on it. And I think coming to it uh, through experiential learning and putting things out there and rubbing against it, these frictions are gonna take us to interesting places. The, the ideology with, with, with which you measure is a big deal as well. Are you going to capture and control? And what are, we don't have an ideology. We're not advocating for anything except deliberation. We think that more data will be more deliberation. And so we advocate for that. And we don't have a particular reason, like the police does, to capture information. Jen. I, I wanted to ask you about your model of planning, which is actually a very classic model as articulated in city planning. Rational comprehensive plan. Yeah. So my question is, aside from the fact that people don't think planning actually works that way, um, where in that loop do you deal with conflict, with exogenous methods, and with imagination? So it, it's, it's a great question, and uh, we'll probably know a lot more about it when we're done with this process. Um, what I'm sure of is that there is a possibility to plan more frequently, to update your plan every minute. To have a policy that is data-driven means to have a policy that changes when the data changes. And, and to, 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 get, to create a stronger interface between plan, implementation, and outcome. And to em emphasize this last part, oftentimes planning seems to me like something abstract and, and sort of almost cold in the sense that it's like, this is how it's going to be from now on, and then you don't adjust the plan. And so I have a hope that the imagination enters where the plan becomes more flexible and more adjustable depending on new data coming in. And that this is a continuous process rather than we decided this five years ago and that's where the freeway is going to go and that's it. Just say, oh, maybe this wasn't the right thing. Maybe we have to adjust it this way or that way and so forth. Does that make any sense? Can we, can we use the concept of revisiting things, of versioning, as a, as a way to, to allow more imagination to enter into the planning process? Yeah, and but I think that in a data-driven plan, you, are all, you also run the risk of foreclosing and acts of imagination that completely alter the conversation. I guess that's what I'm trying to raise. It can be a very heavy hand, the data, right? And, and, but then, what if the data is continuous? Then people can be like, oh, let's see what happens next. It's like a movie, right? You want to know what happens next. And, and that's but good. Sometimes there's no data. Sorry? Sometimes there's no data because nobody's envisioned the possibility of a use. So there's no data. Right. Well, then, then we'd like to bring that in, I guess, right? Yeah. OK, yeah? So how would you measure beauty? Since this may be a Oh, that is a fascinating how you, question. How do you measure the unmeasurable? So, so we, we had about 25 students going into San Leandro, and two or three of them noticed the clinking sound of the labels of the dahlias in the dahlia exhibit in the parking lot downtown. And that one sound was somehow louder in the, in the beauty register than anything else in San Leandro. And many people noticed it. And so, so yeah, we have to stay open to that. And, and we have to welcome that in and say, okay, what are we measuring? Are we measuring the right things? And uh, so now we can maybe measure noise levels or think about what beautiful sounds exist and how loud they are. And so it's a matter of openness, right? So, I think that's interesting, but I think what my question is really getting at is agency. So there the students have agency of what they term beautiful. Right. And so the question really is, is 
do the residents of that place, and the visitors as well, do they have some way in engaging and defining what beautiful is to them? Because maybe somebody finds that in a way to be completely annoying and the most mm. atrocious thing they've ever seen. All so right. then there's a conflict between what the definition of beauty is and how do you encapsulate that and measure it. Well, wouldn't it be great if the residents of San Leandro argue about the concept of beauty? That'd be that'd be wonderful, and they have a conversation about but they, it. They, I would argue that they do, but it's sort of in the job of the person measuring to pick out how. But you're, you're, I think in your both in your and Jen's comp, there's a notion of hierarchy that somehow data is more than direct observation. There's an exclusivity to data. What we're talking about is a synthesis of of lived experience and information. And, and that synthesis is crucial. And how to, if we can do it wrong, that, that it becomes like that. If we do it right, people are like, I see myself there. So yeah, we're going to have to end there, maybe yeah. in the next class. Thank you so much. Thank you.